What do you think orchids have in common with cacti and succulents? What can be common between epiphytic plants that grow in rainforests, cacti, which are desert dwellers, and succulents that are dwellers of mountain and steppe spaces? This may seem absurd at first glance, but if you think about it, there is a lot in common between them. Perhaps no one will be indignant if I say that all of them, cacti, succulents, and orchids, grow very slowly. Many people have asked themselves why their cactus sits in a pot and doesn't grow at all. You'll probably still be surprised if you find that orchids are considered the sloths of the plant world. They grow even slower than cacti. And yes, this is absolutely true. Orchids are among the slowest growing plants in the world, but what makes them be like that? Like cacti and orchids, they are distinguished by the fact that under conditions requiring survival and struggle for existence, they are able to switch to another type of photosynthesis. This is called cam photosynthesis or crassulation acid metabolism. This mechanism was first discovered in plants of the family Crusulaceae, also called the stone crop family. It turns out that several pathways or types of photosynthesis are currently discovered in orchids. In good conditions with sufficient lighting, high temperature, abundant humidity, orchids use ordinary C3 photosynthesis like most other plants. At this time, that orchids grow very slowly. They slowly release flower stalks and grow roots and all of their total biomass even more slowly. We all know that photosynthesis is a process when, with the participation of water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide, and chloroplasts, which are these special cellular green organelles, processes take place in which a plant forms oxygen and glucose in a chain of complex chemical reactions, which then turns into cellulose, sugars, fats, vitamins, and this is what ensures orchids plant growth and flowering. Photosynthesis generally is a very, very complicated process, and it is far from fully understood and studied. During C3 photosynthesis, carbon dioxide enters the plant through the open stomata during the whole day and all night. But as soon as the conditions change, causing drought or decrease in temperature, salinization of the substrate, and most importantly, a sharp decrease in daylight hours, orchids switch from C3 to chem photosynthesis. Unlike normal C3 photosynthesis, the stomata through which gas exchange takes place, in particular, the capture of carbon dioxide, it's only open at night and during the day, they remain closed to reduce moisture evaporation and conserve energy. At night, the absorbed carbon dioxide is bound by malic acid or malate and is retained by it in a cell vacuole until morning. In the morning, the stomata completely closes and the malic acid, through a series of chemical reactions, gives off carbon dioxide and photosynthesis begins when exposed to daylight. And now you don't recognize your orchid anymore because it has to become a completely different plant. It suddenly stops growing. Because of all the processes occurring, they only go to support its life. Further, as it gets colder and the season advances into winter, it becomes darker and darker on the windowsill but the air from the heating in the house or your apartment does not become cooler. On contrary, it becomes hotter and drier. The fact that high night temperatures with a short daylight greatly disrupts the night capture of carbon dioxide. So that slows it down and stops chem photosynthesis, which is a super perfect survival mechanism to which plants are able to fight for their existence in extreme conditions. In these conditions, in our winter houses and apartments, the orchid completely stops photosynthesis, the plant seems to fall into a forced hibernation and lives only by spending the nutrients stored in it from the leaves and roots, gradually depleting. If the orchid manages to hold out until spring and the conditions improve, then photosynthesis resumes and the orchid begins to grow and recuperate. But as a result of all, its growth will be weakened and even more slow. The peduncles and leaves are smaller and the depleted plant eventually dies. So what do we need to do to avoid this? Now that we understand the reasons that lead to this, we're going to try to find a solution to the problem. So let's start by adjusting the main problem, which is lighting. Remember, in natural tropical conditions, daylight is approximately always equal to night and does not change much, except for rainy season when the sky is overcast. For example, Phalaenopsis orchids need eight to 11,000 lux, or the SI-derived unit of illuminance, for the normal course of C3 photosynthesis, during which growth and biomass increase occurs, 
For comparison, in our houses in winter, there are only about 1,000 lux lighting on our windowsill. It obviously follows from all of this that if we plant our orchids to grow during fall and winter, additional lighting is needed. If this is not possible, and your task is only to hold out the plant until spring, then in order to not completely shut down the protective comb photosynthesis, you have to create conditions under which the night temperatures of the windowsill are only 4 to 5 degrees Celsius lower than that during the day. And you also have to increase the air humidity to at least 60%. For example, if during the day you have 24 degrees, at night it should be 20. Put a humidifier or an aquarium near the orchids or build a terrarium for them. This will make the night stomata grip of carbon dioxide much easier and will improve the entire gas exchange, reduce the evaporation of water, and will facilitate the passage of comb photosynthesis. At this point of compensation, that is. When the plant produces exactly what it spends, and at least does not deplete its stored nutrients or substances. In the end, it will safely endure hibernation, and when the daylight starts to increase, the orchid will start growing as quickly as they can as orchids.